lots of people love the oceans, and I think it's a great thing. Lots of people like to eat fish or like to eat sushi. I think that's fine. But I also think that everybody should be aware of what the ocean really looks like, even the part behind the beaches, like way, way behind the horizon. Now, I've spent the better part of the last six, seven years of my life at sea, working well, for Greenpeace, as you heard. Um, and I had the chance to travel the world pretty much two times around the entire thing, meet amazing people, work with fascinating groups, and go to some of the most spectacular places you could possibly imagine. But we also go to these places to witness some of the most horrible stuff you could possibly imagine. Now, coming back from the ships, lots of people ask me, what's the big difference between being on land and being on ship? Now, the obvious ones are, OK, you do get wet every now and then. Sometimes when you go to bed, you actually have to put a line around your belly to actually not fall out of the bed. It doesn't happen too much on land. But the thing that strikes me most, and that is the most important one to me personally, is we're used to a life where we can see everything that's happening around us. Like, looking out of the window, you can see, I don't know, for miles, really. And even though you're moving across the ocean for hundreds and hundreds of miles, you have no idea what's happening right beneath you. And I think that's a big game changer. Now, marine biologists often say counting fish is kind of like counting trees, only you don't see them and they move. So that makes it a little bit tricky, really. And I'd like to invite you to kind of paint a mental picture. Just imagine a nice landscape somewhere in the savannah in Africa. And in there, you have two tanks. In between the two tanks, a big, massive barbed wire fence about 200 meters wide. And these tanks just go plowing through the savannah. And in the fence, you catch zebras, gazelles, lions, the occasional elephant. And in the end, they just keep the gazelles, sell them for steaks, and everything else gets dumped dead. If anybody did that, they would go to jail within seconds, probably. And still, that's what's happening under the water every single day. Bottom trawling is one of the most destructive fisheries that's ever been invented. And a couple of years ago, I was invited to join a trip in the North Sea, which is on the picture here. And only two years before that, I learned, studying marine biology in northern Germany, that the North Sea is one of the areas with massive, big seaweed areas. And I was kind of looking forward to that, because we went there with a big ship equipped with drop cams, ROVs. We went diving loads, basically everything to track down whatever you wanted to look for. And within the entire month, we didn't find a single patch of seaweed in the entire area. What we did find, though, was loads and loads of trawlers. And we actually had the chance to go diving behind one of them, and it just blew my mind. In my head, it was always a net that's kind of slightly dragged across the seabed, and the seaweed would pop up again behind it, but that was very much not like it. The reality looks a little bit different. There's massive weights on the bottom of these nets, and they actually dig deep into the ground basically lifting out everything that's on there, no matter if it's coral, seaweed, fish, crabs, anything. And the cost of it is pretty obvious. We had, at more than only one occasion, two trawlers going side by side, one having a license for fish, the other one having a license for crabs, basically. And they both would collect the exact same stuff, but both of them only had the license for the one side and not the other. So the entire rest of it, just gets dumped over the side, dead, by catch. So every fish you eat, there's about 10 out there dying. Now, in the North Sea, in particular, we were in a marine reserve, marine reserve in that area. It's called the Klaverbank, just off the coast of the Netherlands. And, well, for a small-scale area, the solution for us was pretty obvious. So we brought along with us about 60 rocks, two tons each, and just dropped them in lines right across the seabed. So basically, we reported them to the authorities right away. So by now, they are in sea charts, actually. And fishermen know, OK, if I use my net there, I'm going to lose it. So basically, nobody's fishing in that area anymore. And that works for a small scale. But on the bigger picture, we've got to come up with something better. Imagine, yeah. <laughs> Imagine somebody firing up helicopters to hover above the forests of China, looking for pandas. Mm -hmm. and then imagine the moment he finds the pandas, he sends off a couple of trucks with a big-ass net, just putting it around the entire family of pandas, and then they hoist the entire thing up 
with everything that's around it as well. These people would get crucified within seconds. And still, that's what's happening at sea every day. Every year, the bluefin tuna is coming into the Mediterranean to breed, like literally, to get the kids. And when that happens, the fishing fleets of the entire world are sitting at Gibraltar waiting for them to come in because they are really precious. And it's the most expensive meat in the world that you could possibly get. And of course, it comes with a price again. Now, that year, I got a call and somebody asked me, hey, could you be in Malta in two days and join the Rainbow Boreal for, say, the next two months to be one of our divers and save some tuna? And I was like, yeah, sure, just give me five minutes, I have to quit a job or two, and then I'll be there. And yeah, obviously I went. And what we saw was just, again, mind-blowing. So the way they, touch, they catch the bluefin tuna is basically they spot an entire group of them, and then the mothership, the big one on the upper side of the picture, lays a big net around the entire school of them, and it gets close on the bottom. And the problem with tuna is if they're getting stressed a lot, or if they kind of have to swim fast for whatever reason, they can increase their body temperature by themselves. And they can basically boil the meat from the inside out. And that, of course, would decrease the value of the meat. So what they do is they put, leave them in these nets, and somebody else is throwing a big cage in. They get transferred into these cages, and those get pulled back to shore in Croatia, Greece, all around the Mediterranean, really. And they feed them the entire season, and by the end of the season, they shoot them, with harpoons, usually. Now, that year, the authorities did something smart, and that's something that doesn't happen a lot, really. And they actually asked marine biologists to come up with a number of how much tuna we could possibly catch with being sustainable-ish. And the number they came up with was 15,000 tons as the maximum catch that they could possibly pull out of the ocean. And they also suggested to do it, make it 10,000. So actually, the population could increase a little bit. The number the authorities did come up with was closer to 30,000. And in the end of the season, somebody actually made the effort and broke down how much fish ended up on the market, and that ended up to be about 60,000 tons. And that, at this stage, was about one-third of the world's population of bluefin tuna. And we're talking about a stock that's down on 2% of what it used to be 50 years ago. Another beautiful thing we do, or beautiful invention we came up with, are long lines. Crazy effective pieces, and they are actually exactly what they sound like. It's a really, really long line, about 100 miles. So if you started one here, you could put it all the way to Graz, no problem. And every 10 meters on this line, you have a small line going off it with a good big hook on it. And the idea is catching tuna again. Now, the problem with tuna around the world is that most of the stocks are down 80% already. So we only have one-fifth of the population that originally was here left. And we still catch them in massive rates. And that's pretty much what a long line looks like. And there's thousands of them out there in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific primarily. And if you added up all the long lines that are used around the world non-stop, you would end up with something like 1.4 billion hooks and enough line to wrap it around the entire world more than 500 times. So you have to confess that's a lot of line. And quite frankly, if you have that amount of hooks out there, you don't only end up with what you want. And we've watched them pull out sharks, turtles, dolphins, marlins, swordfish, whatever you could possibly imagine they pull it out. Usually it's already dead. If it's not, they would kill it on deck and chuck it back in. Just because if it's still alive and you throw it back in, it would bite again and another hook is wasted. And especially for sharks, it's a tough time at this time because, well, the shark fins are worth a lot of money and fishermen don't usually make a lot of money. So these are just sliced off. Usually they kill the shark before. Sometimes they just cut off the fins and dump the animal still alive, just sinking down to the bottom and all just for the fins. We keep burning oil at ridiculous rates, and we keep drilling for it in the most remote areas of the planet. A couple of years ago, I think two by now, I was there on an oil rig in Italy, occupying it, camping on the oil rig for a couple of days, just to shut it down. And there's a kind of a yeah, gold rush mood in the Mediterranean right now, and Croatia is just now selling new licenses out to companies around the world to put up more oil rigs along the Croatian coast, which is where lots of us probably go on holidays to. If you look at the Gulf of Mexico, 50 years ago there was one single oil rig in that area, now it's more than 3,000. 
and we're facing the same thing happening in the Met. When the first shipment of Arctic oil came in, there was more than 100 activists in place in Rotterdam to try to stop it from happening. And there's a reason for it. There's plenty of people out there who have had enough, who do realize it's not the time to keep burning fossil fuels, that we're going to suffer from it one way or the other. The Arctic could be ice-free in five years from now. And ironically, we see it as an opportunity to drill for more oil rather than seeing it as a warning, which it should be to us. And right here in Austria, we are kind of in a safe place. We are high up in mountains, seawater rising doesn't really affect us. I mean, it's got to come up 500 meters before we even get wet feet. But we have to look outside the box, really. We have to look halfway around the world. If you go to the Pacific Islands, there's entire nations that get wiped out by typhoons and cyclones that are more regular and stronger than ever before. I've been in Vanuatu only a couple of months ago doing relief work after Typhoon Pam, and this entire place was smashed. It was unbelievable. People lost everything, their homes, their livelihoods, their families. We keep dumping plastics in the ocean. We keep producing it at a massive rate, just tons and tons every single hour. And we tend to say, I'm throwing something away, but it's not away, it's not gone. Just because I throw something out, it's not disappearing. It's still somewhere there, and if you just throw it out on the ground, the chances are that it's ending up in the ocean. By now, we have more plastic in the ocean than we have plankton. And that's actually quite a strong statement, but it is a fact. It's really hard to find a beach that's clean of plastic anymore. And I've been to very lonely beaches around the world, and some of them look just like this. Now, the big question is, what's the solution to all this? And being marine biologist, I kind of have to say that the solution is in the oceans. And I actually truly believe that. The oceans are the one place where most of the carbon we produce is somewhat secured and stowed away. The oceans are producing most of the oxygen, the very air we're breathing right here, right now. More than 70% of it is coming out of the oceans. And yet we keep abusing the system. In the last 50 years, we collapsed, collapsed one-third of the fish stocks worldwide already. If we keep going at that rate, we hit a dead end by 2048. That's not too far away, and we could have collapsed 100% of all fish stocks worldwide by then. And to be honest, I don't want to see that. I wouldn't want to be part of that experience. Now, there's good news, though. We still have half the coral reefs of the world intact. There's still life in there. We still have 10% of the big fishes out there. They're still swimming around, somewhat happy. We still have a couple of whales. There's still tuna in the world. And that's something we should hold on to. And I think one of the keys would be to take what we do on land already and make it a reality in the oceans. If you look at Austria, 27% of the entire country is national parks or somewhat protected areas. If you look at the oceans, and they are covering 70% of the world, only a tiny fraction of less than 5% is protected areas. And those are not even enforced, so nobody's really checking on it. And I think what we have to do now is we have to well, give the power back to the people who are most caring about the oceans, find local communities, find small-scale fishermen, identify valuable spots in the world, breeding grounds, upwelling areas, all these key locations need to be protected areas. And I really hope that within a couple of years we, have, we can have 30, 40 percent of the entire oceans protected, because that's what it's going to take. For myself, with Project Nanaya, together with EcoSwiss, we're going to be working along the coast from Thailand to Burma. That's an archipelago called Megui, one of the last white spots on the world map. No charts yet, no tourism yet, no big industries yet. So we're going to go there, we're going to work together with the local fishermen. We're going to establish marine megafauna databases. We'll be looking for sharks, dolphins, whales, turtles, dugongs in the area, and sample for microplastics. We'll be charting the area. It hasn't been done before. And most important, we'll be working with the locals. And in that case, they're called Moken, and these are the last seafaring nomads on the planet. They're nowhere else. And these are the people who 100% depend on the ocean. If the oceans die, they die. And that's why I believe it's really important to give those people the power back. And the thing I want to leave you with, really, is 
all this, all these things I told you about, and many more, and there's loads more, are happening on our watch. It's our responsibility. We are responsible not only for the Earth, but also for the water, for the oceans. And the oceans have been taking care of us for centuries. They've provided, been providing us with, <laughs> with the air we breathe, with food, with jobs, for ages. And now, not tomorrow, now is the time to give something back to them and take good care of our oceans. Thank you.